So I think that's kind of quite brilliant, right? So what, what are the microaggressions that are uh, occurring there? What are some of those? Where are you from? Yeah, she can't possibly be from. I love it when he says, um, he says, I'm just a regular American. To me, that's a great um, example of this idea that that's what a regular American looks like. And anyone that does not look like that must not be from here. Yeah. What else? What else did you hear? Her English is great. There was so much. Yeah, her English is just amazing. Well, she was born in Orange County, so they do speak English there, right? Um, I think he said one where it was, uh, I make a mean teriyaki chicken. Yeah. I'm just like, isn't that Chinese? <laughs> That's Japanese, actually. Yeah, so, right. Wrong culture. Right, so grouping um, a whole bunch of different Asian cultures together. Yeah, so now what you noticed in the video, and what I think is illustrated so well, is this idea that this guy is oblivious. He actually thinks that he is a cool, hip, diversity expert because he knows terms like kimchi and teriyaki. And he um, likes them. And he likes them, so he must really be uh, one of those hip, regular Americans. It's only the experience of the female jogger, it's really great how she um, kind of flips it, she turns it on his head, and still he doesn't get where she's coming from, right? You're weird. Oh, a question. I, I understand and I agree with all of this, but from your pro professional perspective, how does one create a meaningful cross-cultural experience with a person of a different ethnicity without asking certain kinds of questions, bringing certain kinds of information into the conversation? How does one do that successfully? Okay, so that's a great question. I'm not going to just answer it alone because I know that there's wisdom in here too. <laughs> so. How does one do it? I think that everything starts with a relationship. And I think that um, we are all going to, it's a further slide, we are all going to make these statements. Like, it is not possible to not make these kind of uh, mistakes or these kind of statements. So I think it happens with relationships. It's a lot harder to, uh, Otherwise, mm -hmm. somebody, when you know them, that's kind of how change begins. Um, and also, I guess I would say, you have to be humble enough that when a member of another group says to you, I feel, you know, that had a racist tinge to it, or that's insulting, that you don't put your defenses up or throw it back on them or do the dreaded, I'm not right, you know, I, I can't be this because of this, this, and this reason. So it's not easy. It starts with, I'm a social worker. We say everything happens from uh, relationships. But heck yeah, we're going to make um, mistakes. People, uh, I think actually people can be quite forgiving if you're willing to engage in a dialogue with them and not get your back up when yeah. someone says this was racist, homophobic, sexist. Is that anybody and else? That, 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 that if me? somebody um, say, you know, I find it offensive, you can say, oh, I'm so sorry, I, I'm ignorant about that. Can you tell me about your culture? Tell me, or, you know, ask the person's opinion, per se, because I get that a lot as a Jamaican. So where are you from? Right. When I say my mama. So, <laughs> I, I, I say, you mean what's my culture or stuff like that? So. You know, it's, it's being willing, like you're saying, to admit that I don't know. Can you educate me? And then I'll go over yeah. for it. I'll tell you the other part of this that can be um, really difficult is that we do not always, I do not always want to put the onus on Charmaine to teach me what it is to be Jamaican. You right. know what I mean? So we have to be careful of that, too. I know when I talk to social work students, I say to them, it's not your client's responsibility to tell, tell you about their culture. You're gonna learn stuff about their culture just by creating a relationship with them, yeah. but we also have to, look, we live in a pluralistic, diverse society. Um, you have to, and it's kind of always changing. So there's really an onus on us as well to be open to learning and even sort of like 
being investigatory about various cultures. I know that you had something that you were going to respond to earlier. Did you oh, forget uh, it now? I was just going to. I was just going to say I lived in Europe for 18 years, and you know the question of where are you from, that's quite common in Europe, mm -hmm. because I'm Italian American. So when I met Europeans and I speak with an American accent, they like look at me and go, where are you from? Thinking I'm from Italy. I go, no, the United States. And I go, but I'm Italian American. So this is kind of like almost an American centric kind of problem. Because in Europe, you ask where you're from, you're actually asking, what is your nationality? Yeah. That's the, in America too. Yeah. Go ahead. In my personal experience, and I feel like you can the balls into that question, but the problem comes in is a lot when you're dealing with people, is that that's like the first question, like, what are you, where are you from, mm -hmm. like, ask you some other cursory thing, <laughs> yes. like, something about your numbers, like, what yeah. are you, where are you from, <laughs> there's all types of other things that you can divulge into to learn about a person before you broach a subject like that, but the fact that, like, I just walk up to where you from, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, there's all set, like, you don't even know my name and you're asking where I'm from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this really what are you thing also I think is an incredibly <laughs> awful question. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh, my question is, like, one of the things I get all the time that always makes me mad is um, you talk so well or you talk so articulate or whatever the answer is. Microaggression. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm conjugated. Um, <laughs> we can start there. But um, but the question is like how do you then you know then when you toss it back to them and you tell them it's a microaggression they're like well I would tell someone you know a white person that they speak well too you know or they try to then say no you wouldn't I mean I could see if you know if I was giving a speech then you would maybe tell you know a white person and a black person so then they always think that you're like the angry black person or you're just trying to throw the weak cards like what is the response to that because that's I think of all the microaggressions between that and touching my hair, which we can, that's probably a whole other conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, how do I respond to that again? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, I actually have some stuff in following slides, okay. so I'm not avoiding your question. I promise I'll come back to it. Go ahead. Yes, I've been um, halfway around the world. It's really just America. It's like, the rest yeah. of the world don't see black and white. Mm -hmm. A country is a country. What they are. Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican. Uh, yeah. Singaporeans are Singaporeans. America no. is separated. Uh, 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 yeah, so the context becomes really important. I think it just depends because you can go to other countries and you can get um, racially profiled, and you know they've been talking about all these attacks in India and stuff like that lately, where black people have gone over there and they've been racially attacked, beaten up, and been called all sorts of names. And I, I, I was actually born in Japan, but I, I didn't, I, I have never lived there, but I've heard that. Um, because my parents live there, that if you are a black person, that you sometimes will fi will face um, racial prejudice by being in you know in other countries. So it could just I don't think that's really <coughs> fair to say like across the board. And I also know um, not to take up a whole lot of time, but I also know in Jamaica, and I, I hope not to offend anyone that's from Jamaica, but I know that when I've been there, being <coughs> very light skinned, um, that I've actually gotten sort of a I don't know, uh, some sort of internalized, I don't know what you want to call it, feeling over there that I'm preferential because I'm so light-skinned and it's almost like they were obsessed with me. Um, my mom had the same experience. My mom's like, it was very uncomfortable. Um, so yes. there's, there's all sorts of different experiences. So right, so really when we think about microaggressions and some of this stuff, we frequently, uh, there's sort of a flip side aspect of this, which would be um, being exoticized. Right. Um, you know, it's just sort of as insidious because you're being kind of objectified based on a single facet right. of you, right? right? Hold on, I want to ask you with the notebook. Oh. Go ahead, you had a comment. I was just going to say, I think, like, in the idea of how in other countries the people from there sort of own, like, in Puerto Rico or Puerto Rican and all that. I think one of the reasons that the microaggressions are so upsetting, I guess, to a person of color is because if you're born here, you are an American, and so to automatically be asked just for no reason where you're from, like her, the, the lady in the video, it's like, but I'm American too. And yeah. it's like, we don't get to own it as much, because they always put the hyphen to be an Asian American. Right, okay. 
the blank in there. Go ahead. I was just curious if uh, in your research if you have anything that touches on the fact that like that microaggression also is internalized because like she was speak talking about how somebody white says she speak, speaks well. I know when I first moved here from I'm from up north in Ohio, my first experience in the school here in Fort Wall Beach, Florida, I opened my locker and there was some other African American girls and they asked me a question, I responded and they said, You talk like a white boy and they literally were like, you know, like walked away and had nothing to do with me and it's like this is how I, I speak, I mean, but yeah. it's internalized as well. Absolutely, we internalize it. In fact, I think um, it, it's poignant to me that when someone uh, says, oh, you're very articulate, that you have to say that you're college educated. Like, that's ridiculous that you would have to go, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, so, so yes, I mean, we are part of a larger society, and by osmosis, you take all of this stuff in. It's how these things keep going in many ways, but I do think it's particularly kind of, you know, devastating that, yeah, we end up internalizing a lot of, uh, a lot of this stuff, and then we can even turn it on each other within our own groups, which is also devastating. I'm just going to say that experiences are so varied, regardless of where you live, but we know that within Puerto Rican culture, if you go to Puerto Rico, if you live there any length of time and have good friends from there, those Puerto Ricans and in Cuba and so many of the um, Caribbean um, countries, uh, what that division between Haiti and the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic, uh, right. I mean, the, they have the same issue. Color is an issue. Du Bois was not wrong when he said color will be the issue of the 20th century. It will be the color of the 21st, 22nd, and probably on until we're all caramelized. Yeah. So I don't want to deny anybody's experience, but I, what I simply want to say is that there's enough evidence that whether you're in Japan or Puerto Rico or wherever, and what about American history? What happens you know, in, the, in the sorority movement among African Americans? The whole history. Oh, you're this. So, oh, that's all of the light-skinned girls are in that sorority, and oh, you know, all of the people of this particular color are looking for a mate who is of a brighter color because you got to look out after your offspring. So, what it really comes down to, and I share with you this relationship, and we must not be always so on guard uh, to decide that people are doing this. Yes, they're doing it, and sometimes it's just well enough for you to know it and build a relationship with them over time, and you can begin to see change. If you go around trying to educate every time you hear this, my God, you'll be in one of the state institutions in short order. <laughs> yeah, because there's a cost, right? There's a cost to the individual. Go ahead and then I'm going to sort of keep going. But yeah, go I would say, I mean, she mentioned Haiti. I'm from Haiti. Uh, so, um, one thing, I've never been to Dominican Republic, but it's terrible, the relationship. But I've yeah. been here. I mean, one thing I, I've heard a lot is when they say, where are you from? I'm from Haiti. Why here? From Haiti and here. I mean, I've heard that a lot, even in my own you know, jobs. Yeah. I've heard that a lot. I don't really get offended, you know, personally, so I just talk to people and they talk, they share it, but it's something I'm very about. Yeah, so the immigrant experience. Okay, one more, but I swear. No, growing up in Texas, I'm from Texas, and coming here back in the 88 when I came to Pensacola with my children, they, it was really bad on the children because the children, uh, my, in my neighborhood, they would say, you know, you, you all sound white. Your children sound white, you know. But I've, you know, I've never heard that word mentioned so much until I moved to Pensacola from Houston. You know, right. it's, it's so again, the context. Uh, <laughs> just because you know Elizabeth Eckford, you get a, you get a pass. I just want to say post-traumatic slave syndrome, get the book. 
Yes. Read it. Get it on Amazon. Post traumatic slave syndrome. Joy. Post traumatic slave syndrome. And so, even don't just think that these are issues, these aggressions are only issues that address issues of folks that are outside of different races. It's within the race as well. So, as a light skinned African American woman who sounds white with hazel eyes, I've had a very hard, challenging experience. And when folks would ask my grandma, why did she sound like that? They would, she would say, because she was raised in Europe. Yeah. No, I was raised around a whole bunch of white folks, but you know, that doesn't negate <laughs> that I'm still her granddaughter. But that was the only thing that she could say that would placate the folks who were asking the question in the first place. Okay, let me, um, so. Uh, three <laughs> kinds of uh, racial microaggressions. The micro assault um, is the much more uh, overt uh, version, oftentimes expressed in private or when someone loses control and something is blurted out. Um, the micro insult is um, these, I call them sort of like low grade insults of which the perpetrator is frequently unaware. So one of the aspects of microaggressions is that when you do point it out to people, said your experience, like they'll immediately try to discount it. Oh my gosh, that's not what I meant. Again, like it's your problem. And then comes the micro invalidation, which are communications or actions that uh, invalidate thoughts, feelings, and experiences of people of color. Like, um, oh, it's like, um, no, that security guard was not following you around like that's in your head. Or, I've been to a mall and a security guard has followed me around. So, it's not, right? Okay. What would you call with someone, I have a coworker that used to do this all the time to me, and you know, you talk about relationships. <coughs> We had a relationship where we keep that very friendly.